Welcome to La Taverna Friuli Wines, the definitive podcast on wines from Friuli Venezia Giulia. I'm your host, Wayne Young. So, oh, hey, here we are. Rosella's here. Quinn is here. Um, and we are here in La Taverna with Matteo Bellotto from the Colio Orientale Consortio. Um, thank you, Matteo, for being here this evening. Thank you, man. It's always and good to see you. Hi to everybody. Yeah, hi to everybody. Um, Obviously, the room will fill up as time goes on. I did have a couple of friends sort of ping me and say that they were going to be coming. So, And I've also pinged them back. There's Luciana. Hi, Luciana. How you doing? Welcome. If you want to come up on stage, I'm going to invite you on up to speak. Um, same thing with you, Rosella. I know normally you're here just kind of to speak, but certainly I'll bring you up on stage if you have some questions. The new face that I have here is a guy named Quinn with a very scary mask on. Um, but anyway, surf and wine the way nature intended. So, um, Quinn, definitely jump in if you have a question. So, um, Matteo, I'm really happy that you're here. Thank um, you. I, I love the fact that we had like a really cool conversation before we started tonight, but, um, we have to sort of introduce you to the people who are listening. Yes. So tell me a little bit about who you are and especially what you do, because I think that's the thing that's most important. Well, uh, thanks, Wayne. Uh, I'm just a consultant. I, I like to introduce myself just being a, a worker on my earth, a worker on my land. And uh, I used to uh, play my game just in helping people and helping the producer to be known all around the worldwide with the things that I can arrange and the things that I can make to uh, put to wines so, of uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia to be known as uh, good as I can do and uh, in the place, uh, in the right place that they can be, you know, tasted, they can be, you know, uh, understood. So uh, my goal is to work just like the winemakers used to do with the land, to be peaceful, understandful, and listening to the land and uh, to make the silent of Friuli Venezia Giulia to be known. Okay, so um, what was, so give me an idea of like sort of how you got into this whole world. I mean, you, before working for the Colli Orientali uh, Consortium as a consultant, I think you also worked for Colio, did you not? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I just started from Colio. Well, the path uh, in my common and this uh, and this land and this work uh, has been so long. But you know, my path uh, just started when I was a kid, and my grandfather used to have a vineyard in the back uh, of uh, my house. And uh, where, where, I, where was this? Uh, in Gemona. In Gemona. In Gemona, yeah. Ah, so you're from Gemona. I'm from Gemona. So yeah. you're born, raised, you are like Friuli Doc. Yeah, born sure. Born and bred. De deeply Friuli Doc. Okay. Yeah. Like D-O-C-G. <laughs> a, a, a native Friuli Doc. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, my grandfather used to be a farmer, he used to have the vineyard and all the stuff around the vineyard. And I used to help him in you know, all the things and stuff that... Uh, uh, he needed to to be helped, uh, but when I was a kid, I never liked to help him because I was just like uh, uh, thinking about becoming a rock star or an NBA player or something like that, something that goes around and above all the things that you can imagine. And uh, when my grandfather died, I understood that I never learned by him how to put my hands into the earth and uh, I learned other things because I, I had the, the luck to, to study and to do whatever it is you know is 
thought about uh, people just like in my generation. And uh, when I realized that, uh, I just say to myself, I want to do everything in my power to give back to my land what I acknowledge in my life. So mm, I like to think about myself just like a man on a mission. And my mission is to give something back. Give something back to my land and give something back to the people which are my land and my people uh, and what I had learned uh, to my, you know, with my experience. So this is my goal. I want to uh, make my land to be recognized as it is. So what do, you ha do you have like in your memory kind of a defining moment when you said, yeah, wine is what I want to do. I have that moment, but I want to know if you have that moment too. Was there, or was it sort of like a gradual kind of fading into? It's been a kind of gradual fading into. Okay. I remember the first time that I tasted wine because I used to help my grandfather in going into the fields and, you know, in, in helping him. And one time, I think I was uh, 10 or 11, and uh, I did not bring with me the water. Now, it was August, so it was summer, hot summer. And I used to have my grandfather, you know, and, uh, you know picking up uh, the grass in the land. But I, I did not have the water. And my grandfather used to bring his own wine, you know, into the field. And, uh, so no, no water. No water. Wine. So that's wine. what he drank when he was working. Yeah, just... But it was normal because yeah. uh, wine was just uh, uh, something just like we have uh, uh, right now. We have all the stuff that we put to, into ourselves when we go uh, cycling <laughs> or whatever. And uh, our grandfather used to have wine. And uh, I had nothing. And uh, my grandfather said, uh, well, this is what you can drink. And I had it. And uh, my memory How is... How old were you? I think I was 10 or 11. Oh, so you didn't have any water, so your granddaddy yes. offered you wine. Yes. Okay. And uh, I just tasted it, and for me it was awful, completely awful, uh, because it was just like, you know, just like a kid having wine. I mean, it was awful. But that memory comes, you know, brings me back. As soon as I started at the university, my, you know, my life. Um, I just graduated in philosophy. And for my family, it was nothing about studying philosophy because it was nothing in the mind of my family just like having a, a job or something like that. So I said to my parents, because I, I got a, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, soul. <laughs> and I said, all right, uh, you don't want to give me money to you know, bring up my education and philosophy, I'll do it myself. So I just started okay. a job in a bar. Ah, okay. And I started a job in a bar in Padova, where okay. I've been, you know, graduated. Oh, where you were studying? Yes. Okay. And uh, that bar, you know, the bartender was very, very, you know, into the wine. And uh, he made me, you know, understand all the stuff and all the things related to the wine. I've been working more than 10 years behind the counter. And I understood, you know, the wine and I understood how much I've lost from my, you know, grandfather job. And that was the starting point. Okay. I knew that for sure. Uh, wherever I, uh, wherever you go, and I told to myself, watching myself in the mirror, Wine is going to be on your side. So it's going to be a moment because, you know, my life, I, I did a lot of things. I've been living in London. I've been living, you know, all abroad and stuff like that. And uh, I understood that that kind of education and that kind of thought just brought me back. And right now I understand that every single poem, just like, you know, uh, pointing the you know all the, all the steps that you did in your life right now uh, i'm in my path so this is uh this is something so it's kind of like you looking back you can see all of these points connecting and yes. guiding you to the point where you are now 
Yes, yes. That's very cool. That's it very is. cool. Yeah. It is. I, you know, that, that is very, excuse me, <clears throat> very different for me because I, I, the first half of my life basically had nothing to do with wine professionally and now sort of like the second half of my life, if you could break it down and break big broad strokes like that. Um, yeah, is is all dedicated to, to wine and, and that. So yeah, I don't have like childhood memories of wine. Um, my, my mom and my aunt who, who were basically raised me were teetotalers. I mean, I remember when I was 21 years old and I brought my first or, or 17 years, 18 years old, brought my first six pack of beer home and they were like, oh, there's beer in the fridge. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was like really wild. So it was, it was quite a different experience for me. So, you know, for me, seeing well, that yeah. arc in your life to arrive where you are now must be yeah. very satisfying. If you know where, where I come from, uh, I used to go by bike and going in school uh, when I was a kid. And when I was a kid, my mother used to prepare me in the morning coffee with some grappa before I go to school because they used to say... Coffee uh, with grappa. Yes, because they used to tell me, uh, whatever you got called, you got something. And uh, my grandfather used to have this big bowl of coffee, right? And he, he used to put uh, the grappa that he did himself and he put half a coffee and half a grappa because he didn't want half to blow. Half. Yes, he didn't want to blow on, on it. On the coffee, he wanted to cool it off. Exactly. So instead of using milk, he used grappa. Exactly, exactly. Wow. And he and made the grappa at home. When we were children, uh, as a child, when we, we had the, the teeth growing off, uh, uh, our parents used to, you know, um, wet the fingers into grappa and to put it in our mouth just to, you know, uh, to ease the pain. Yeah, for, for us in the States, it was whiskey. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> and I got all that memory. You know, for me, having grappa with coffee in the morning is nothing strange. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's something that is related uh, with some culture. I don't want to think that, to make people think that we are just, a, you know, a drunken culture people. But this is uh, something that is very related to this land. And uh, it's something that is very close to this land. Well, it's it it's um it's a health thing as well, like you said, right? You have some grappa because if your throat's a little sore, maybe you're getting a cold. Like they thought that grappa was sort of like an antiseptic. It was like an antiviral. Like if you drank some grappa, it would help you feel better, or it would keep you from getting sick in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, but. I don't want to make that people uh, see this just like a healthy thing to have grappa. But of course, uh, alcohol and grappa and wine was not about having a booze, but just was about having a consumption and having something that makes you powerful in your day and was something that you never have to have uh, more than you need. Okay. It's just, it was a staple. It was a, yes. it was it was a it was a necessity of life. It was like exactly. bread. Exactly. Yeah. So it was a, it was a source of caloric energy. It was a source of of energy of of your personal energy, but yes. also of of uh, you know of, of, of it was a healthy thing to, to drink. It was better than the water, probably. Yeah, because <laughs> because uh, the point of this because wine and uh, you know alcohol during the period in Friuli Venezia Giulia before you know and. After the Second World War, having some wine was way much more healthier than having water, because water was uh, filled of you know bacteria, and wine with this maceration project process and the alcohol helped you in having something that was not with bacteria. Okay. So you used to have wine even if you are a child. Just because you have something healthy. Right. Right. It's better than drinking the water. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yes. So let's jump ahead and let's talk about your current project, which is something that I think is is and, and you you know, this is obvious that it's unique in the world. I don't think that anybody else in the world is doing it which is the Tasting Academy. Yeah. So can you tell me, tell us a little bit about that? I mean, I, I'm sure that there are people, there are people, the people who are listening right now, I see on Clubhouse, aren't in for you, really. So... Um, this could be a really good way to get them to come. But, I mean, yeah. it's an amazing project, and, and I want to hear more about it from you. 
Well, I started this project during the, the lockdown period. And, uh, and I started to think, uh, what about to uh, help people in the Oreca, as we know, so people working in the restaurants, in the bars and whatsoever, to have a way to taste many wines and to understand the geography, the specific geography of our wine. You know, we know something by the fact. is not so hard to make wines. Instead, it's very hard to make wine grapes. So this is the point. Okay. And so all the work is taking place outside. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the point is this, uh, because I acknowledge this, when we speak, all of us, we used to have accents, right? And... Uh, We, ha we have accents in every language that we speak. We can speak Italian, we can speak English, we can speak Friulano, we can speak whatever. And uh, these accents, they used to tell you where you come from, right? Ah, and, okay. And this is easy. Gotcha. And I think that wines got accents. Mm, okay. Every wine tells you where it comes from. You just have to be able and to I understand acknowledge the accent. This, yeah. And I acknowledge this. What if I have a, a room, just like it's the Tasting Academy, with 32 wines, because we got 32 wines, coming from different parts, and we're talking about now the Colli Orientale, of course, that they are easy to make you understand where they come from with their accents. Whether they come from, you know, Corno di Rosazzo, from Savorniano, from Cividale, and whatsoever. So do you, do you choose the wines for the Tasting Academy? I did. I did. You it. did. Okay. I did. I did by so, territory. Okay. So you knew that each one of these wines really spoke of its territoriality, really yes. spoke its own accent. Because the guys that works in Colli Orientale, this Francesco and Davide, which are the technical part, used to map every single vineyard into the territory. So I asked to the wineries to bring me the wines, whether I can relate that wines to the single vineyard. So where you come in the Tasting Academy, the magic comes because I never talk about wines, but I just talk about the vineyards. And you can taste eight different Friulano, for example, And in this eight different Friulano, you can have eight different vineyards where that Friulano comes. People used to come there and ask me, um, I can feel into this, you know, almond or stuff like that. And I, and I used to tell this, if you feel something, that's yours. I got a book with the aromas and with the defects of the wines. You can play with them. Yeah, you have the the, the, the book. The, yeah, the, the Nez du Van, the, the, the exactly. samples of the aromas, right? Exactly. So it's not just like a, a book of pages, it's a book of smells, like these little exactly. perfumes that you smell. Um, anybody who knows anything about a wine knows that, that these things are available. But some people might know that these, don't know that these things exist. Yeah. Little bottles with, you know, everything from leaven to lavender to cork to mold to all of this sort of thing so you can get that and you have that there yes so you can sort of train your palate as well for sure okay and then uh, you can taste all these different wines you can have uh, eight different Firulano, eight different sauvignon some pinot blanc uh, some malvasia some you know pinot grigio and uh, ribol and then the red wines and you can you know with all the bottles there into you know, the, um, the stuff, you know, the, the enomatic, enomatic which, are, yeah. which are just machines. They used to put the wines and, you know, make the wines to be perfect for, you know, just one month, for exactly, example. Yeah. Just like the, they've just been helping. And uh, you taste this, you understand that uh, when you go to the bar and you ask for a friulano, the point is this, all of us used to do that thing where when we come to the restaurant, we open the menu and we watch, you know, the, um, the right page, uh, where is the prices, right? Uh, okay. And this is, and this is normal. I mean, right. everybody, you know what to. you want to spend. The second thing that you do 
is trying to figure out if you know some of the labels that you may maybe listen or maybe seen uh, that can be. Yeah. My point is this. What if we acknowledge where they come from? Because it's not about the prices, it's not about the labels, but it's about the geography. Because if I am, uh, I mean, I want to have an aperitivo or something, right? And I ask for a friulano, for example. I have to, to know that if I choose a friulano that comes from Corno di Rosazzo, can I have 15 degrees of alcohol. Or if I choose a friulano that comes from Savorniano, can I have uh, 12.5. Okay. And uh, if I know that geography, just in this thing, makes me understand that I can have an aperitivo or something else, makes me, uh, you know, someone that understands what he's choosing. And uh, if I have, as an aperitivo, a friulano with 15 degrees... It's hard to tell that I can, you know, order a second glass. Yeah. <laughs> but if I understand the geography, maybe I know that I have to ask something that comes from the north. Exactly. And so the, from a cooler place, so exactly. you can have two glasses. And the, the thing that we do in the Tasting Academy is not to tell them, you know, slogans or uh, stories or whatever, but just data. I just tell what I can prove. And six, uh, you know, since uh, 16 years, 17 this years, uh, the guys are making this big relation, you know, this uh, big written, you know, uh, report. The yeah. yeah, the technical relation they used to do every year. Yeah. With all the data what, about what happened in the, you know, single, you know, harvest in the single year. So you can compare all that thing. I brought all the data and I put it on the table. It is complex. I know that. But nature is complex. Obviously. We are complex. If we want to, uh, you know, acknowledge, if, if we want to say something about the wine, which is, uh, you know, trying to get it simple, it's just like, uh, uh, you know, making people to tell something about us uh, just looking at uh, our glasses or our hat or shoes. We are people, complex people, right? Every person is complex. Nature is complex. We have to leave the complexity. And I want to make people understand the complexity because if we understand the complexity, we talk about the accents. And if we save the accents, we're talking about wine. If wine has not accents, we're talking about beverage. Exactly. Exactly. So how, I mean, I've, I've been to the Tasting Academy. I've mm -hmm. been, you know, wowed by the, the Tasting Academy. But so all of this data, how is it accessible to the people who come to the Tasting Academy, how do they access this, this data that you have? I told them. <laughs> I mean, you tell well, you, okay, you know, yeah, I know, and I show them. I show them okay. with, a, with a, a, a big screen that we have in the Tasting Academy, yeah, and we have a, a 3,200 vineyards mapped. And uh, through this big, you know, screen, three thousand two hundred vineyards in Friuli, or just Colli Orientale, just Colli Orientale. So three thousand two hundred vineyards mapped in Colli Orientale. Yes, and it's uh, more, more or less. And with each vineyard, sixty-seven percent of the entire vineyards. Wow! And so for each one of those vineyards, you have data on temperature rainfall humidity yeah age vintage date age yes how old the vines are yeah you have that too yeah i have everything so I've, you could be sitting there with a bottle of wine and you can access on this giant screen yes all of this information yes exactly wow. exactly that's incredible. all all the information i just uh, you know um you can see the vineyard naked and you can see the bottles naked i mean uh, it seems like that, uh, it sounds like porn right now, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, but it's a kind of porn because uh, we are in a moment of the communication and in the marketing and uh, the storytelling, so to speak, 
uh, which is something like that you have to construct on the wines, on the bottles, and on the territories. My goal is to do exactly the opposite. It's just to not inventing anything, but just telling the truth, telling the exactly exact thing that you can say just what you can prove you can say and people that come from to me just have the truth in that thing and uh, we are in a moment in our society where the truth is such an important subject yeah <laughs> yes with fake news and alternate reality and I alternate aim, facts and you know yeah. i aim for deal. the truth right. and i mean every people that comes there they could be prepared they could be you know sommeliers on the you know hundredth level they could be absolutely uh, none uh, you know uh, people that do not anything about wine all the people come outside the Tasting Academy, and they got something. Because I thought this, and I tell you this, uh, because uh, COVID makes, uh, made us understand a lot of things. And uh, it is something about the contagious, right? We have to, to be distant to other people. We have to uh, behave differently. We have to clean up ourselves that I mean, we had to do even before, but right now we have to do it more. Because, a little bit extra, yeah. Yeah. And my point is this. What if I can contagio, you know, people with information? Because my goal is to make a contagion and make a pandemic about information and correct information about my land. And I want the people that comes into the Tasting Academy are contagious by myself with information and correct information. This so is my goal. You have in front of you the wine and all the information about yes. that wine. And so that's, yes. that's, that's special. I don't think there's any place else in the world where you can do that. No, because... Uh, I'm bare naked there. I mean, uh, not literally. I mean, that don't tell no, don't not, tell that to people because then no, they won't come. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not literally. But uh, the second thing, because uh, I got this thirty-two wines with the three thousand two hundred vineyards mapped uh, and that thing, and uh, I have uh, uh, no access to the prices and to the you know uh, selling thing about the wineries, and this is very important because. I'm completely free to tell the wines. And people that come there knows that I'm not selling. I'm just telling. Yeah, as we say in English, you have no skin in the game. Exactly. So if these people buy these wines, don't buy these wines for you, it's, it's no. exactly the same. All you want them to have is the truth and the experience exactly. of tasting the wine. And I tell them the truth. What happens uh, many times, you know, people tell me, well... Uh, I've been tasting that one. Uh, how much is it? The thing that I do, I call the producer. I directly call the producer, and I just pass, you know, you know, the contact directly, and I tell them uh, they've been here in the tasting academy. They're gonna come through you to buy right now. Okay, is that okay to you? <laughs> <laughs> so this is what happened. You know, today. Uh, there was this, uh, you know, five guys uh, coming, you know, from France. They want to have this vineria, you know, winery in, a, you know, in the shop of, uh, of wines in Paris, uh, shop about, you know, uh, Friuli wines. They tasted the wines and they, you know, wanted to have, uh, you know, information and to buy some of these wines. And my thing it was very simple. I just called all the producers I just arrange the appointments and they're going to get there and buy. And one of the things that I used to say to the producer, if you got 10 minutes, 10, uh, that you need to talk about yourself, seven minutes you need to talk about where you come from because, uh, you know, Friuli, nobody knows what it is. So you need seven minutes on this 10 and then three minutes for your wine. One of the things they used to tell the producer, give me your seven minutes. 
Eun gave you a ten. So yeah, so you tell them about the place. Yes. And then when they get there, they can go directly into the story about the bottles and exactly. about the wines. So they don't have and to waste why? time telling people about Ponka and telling people about this or that or whatever. Or whatever. They already got all of that. Exactly. That's great. That's amazing. So um, so you had a group today from from uh, from France. Yes. You know, and you said that the- France and Switzerland. Actually. And Switzerland. And they're going to open a place. And then you told me that tomorrow you have people from Russia coming. Yes, exactly. As well. Yes. So the, the Tasting Academy is exploding. Yeah, it's exploding. One of the things that I like is that these guys just found out the Tasting Academy and they arranged it not just to come in the Tasting Academy, but for sure, you know that they're coming from France or Russia and they arrange even, you know, a holiday in Friuli Venezia Giulia. And then they asked me where to go to eat, where to go to, you know, uh-huh. to have some things. And I have all the things that Promo Turismo used to tell me. And I told them everything that I knew. And I'm, and I knew a lot of things. Of course you do. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and they, you know, they can arrange their holiday in Friuli Venezia Giulia. And you know what? One of the things uh, that everybody that came in, you know, in the Tasting Academy just told me, if I had to choose a, a sentence that everybody told me, there's one sentence, we need to come back. And this is something that is free related to me. And I, I really, you know, tied to myself just like a goal. Well, that's, that's really important because what you've done is you've, you've created so much interest and, and you've inspired people so much yeah. that they feel like, oh, I've only scratched the surface here. Exactly. I need to come back and I need to learn more. That's you know, it. They didn't come one time as like, yeah, okay, well, I've learned everything I need to know. I don't need to yeah. come back here anymore. But yeah, you. so now all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, Friuli's really cool. Coyote and Tali's hot. I got to come back. I got to learn more. And that's really, really important. Yeah, because, you know, just you said... Even Friuli Colli Orientale is just a surface. I mean, uh, we've got 3,200 vineyards uh, mapped. We have to work more to do this. Uh, we got a lot of other DSC, just like Colli, Zonzo, Aquileia, and whatsoever, whatever. I mean, we got so many things that you need to do in a small place because it's uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia, it's, it's a nutshell. And uh, you and un- as you understand that you're just there and you had a holiday uh, of a week, you can figure out that, Jesus, I, it's not enough. I mean, I have to come back. And uh, it happened to me last week that it was um, two guys coming from Como, right, close to Milan. And uh, they had a tasting academy. Then they asked me where they can uh, have some frico. And uh, I just uh, pushed them to Cividale and then uh, in other places that they call me back and ask me where, uh, where, they, come, where they can go. And then uh, this week, and, you know, it's been uh, the brother of that, you know, of one, you know. Of, of one of those guys. Yes. So they, basically they came and then they said to the they came brother, and they you said, gotta go. you got to go. And he came. Wow. And he came, and he came. Uh, I mean, I'm not working as a, um, you know, tourism is not my goal, of course. I'm, right. I'm doing something different. I'm doing the promotion of the wines. Of the wines. But, but yeah, through it's the connected. Wi- but through the wines, uh, you can say a lot of things. And uh, as soon as you understand that you have not to talk about the wines, you open the world of a land I mean, uh, if I would be there in just having, you know, the sentence, just like uh, the, the flavors and the stuff and the sommelier thing, right? Okay. Uh, probably I would got people that would never come back. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that because I was going to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on that. So, yeah, if you just sort of sit and evaluate the wine, you know, sight, smell, sip, the whole thing, the five S's. It's super dry and you don't really, it doesn't inspire you that much. I mean, I just had a, a, a recent experience with that, you know, beautiful place, amazing food, um, and the most boring tasting. 
Uh, and I was really disappointed with the tasting. It's just like, there, this could have been so much better if you didn't do like that sort of very structured ice tasting, which I, I, I'm not a big fan of. I can tell you what I did today. Tell me what you did today. And then I'm going to ask the, the folks in the, in the audience if they have a question. So tell me what you did today. Everybody, if you got a question for, for Matteo, prepare yourselves. I'm going to ask you to, to come up on stage and speak. So go, Matteo. What I did today, uh, we had on the tasting, you know, with the wines, we had a Malvasia, a beautiful Malvasia. I won't tell the producer that it doesn't matter in this moment. And that Malvasia for me reminded me, you know, the Malvasia Estriana from Fiori Venezia Giulia is uh, salt. Is the salt is one that you can uh, acknowledge. And people used to think yeah. about a sweet wine in, a, in Italy, but it, it's very salty. And Malvasia for me, um, I was, uh, uh, you know, um, I was enough with words to tell them. One of the things that I did has been to put on the screen uh, the gray gig in the sky of Pink Floyd. And I tell them, just listen right now. Put your nose in it uh, until, and before, before, uh, you know, the Mrs. Terry starts with, uh, <laughs> with uh, uh, you know, with, with, the, with the gig, screen. With, yeah, with the gig exactly. in the sky. And when she starts, you just put the one in your mouth and you understand what this mouth is here. So I did it, through, you know, Pink Floyd music. So you're doing almost like a little bit of a multimedia kind of experience in there too. I kind of, I only, kind of. But only for special people <laughs> or for everybody. For everybody, yeah. everybody's special. Yeah. So that's the point. And uh, I mean, uh, wine is just about uh, keeping us together. And uh, if a bottle... Uh, my grandfather used to tell me this. If you put your nose more times than you put your mouth in a glass, that wine's got some problem. Got some problem? Yes, because mm. that wine is eager to be drunk, not to be, you know, smelled. Smell. Oh, okay. So if we are talking more about the wine instead of talking about ourselves, so the wine is not doing this work. I mean, wine is just to keep us together. Okay. We have not to talk about the wine. Wine talks for himself. Okay. And wine is to be on the table to keep us together. Gotcha. Okay, okay. So I want to give the opportunity. I have Luciana, Heather, and June up on stage here, and I wanted to give them all a chance to, uh, to talk. Luciana, did you have a question for Matteo or a comment? Thanks oh, for coming. Hello, guys. Thanks for coming, by the way, Luciana. Always a pleasure to hear about Friuli wine. You I, know that. I, it's I in love, my heart. love having you here. Um, Mr. Bellotto, um, what people need to have uh, to enjoy or to be as accepted for the Academy um, experience? Do they need, like, a WSET degree or any kind of we study um, how it works. Well, uh, no, it doesn't need everything. I mean, uh, every people is accepted into the tasting academy. Um, we thought about the tasting academy for the professionals, just to have something, you know, a kind of master class about the colorentale. But one of the things that is happening right now that I didn't, you know, thought before, is that, that many people are gifting the experience of tasting and kind of just like, uh, you know, the, uh, the birthday gift. And uh, all the people that, that, you know, can come there with no preparation. And uh, as soon as they come there, they understand that uh, you can have a kind of preparation and into the testing academy, we can do. We can go very deep into the preparation because I can tell you, you know, every kind of different, you know, treatments that have been in the vineyards or analogically. But you can be freely just uh, to have a taste, uh, and it's open to all the people that want. I try to, um, you know, um, diversify the people because some of them 
are much more professional and interested in something as some of them just want to acknowledge something. And right now is something that I uh, do not know and uh, is happening because, uh, you know, people that wants to come there, just, uh, just get there and uh, it's not important that they are prepared or not. So it's open to everybody. We used to get them free to the people which are professionals. And whether you're not a professional, you just pay one year for every, you know, single sip. And, uh, you know, the best you can do is put in 30 euros. I was going to say, basically, if it's one euro per sip and you have 30 wines or 32 wines, yeah. That's a, that's a pretty economical afternoon of learning about yes, freely yes, and wines. Yes, yes. It's, yeah. If you go to a winery, you're going to pay you know, our 15 goal, bucks for four wines. Exactly. But our goal is not to uh, you know, have money for this. Our goal is to make this thing to be talked about. Because as you said, Wayne, uh, this thing is unique in Italy. There's no place what is done just the way we do this. And uh, my goal is to make much more people to come in there. I don't care about money in this moment because we uh, have a goal as a consortium. We have a goal as, a, you know, as people working just like I do. We want to make our land to be spoken to. So you're just, yeah. So, so in answer to Luciana's question, no, there's no prerequisite to no, come in. No, absolutely there's no. No, no, no. So no. you can just come and, and be a complete novice and learn no. about freely. But, you know, you can just come, but we can have different kinds you of, know, conversations. Of, of conversation because I'm, you know, I'm prepared to talk about the, what, you know, what the, the molecules that you put into the vineyards or what you did into the, the cellar right. to whatever. So we have all the different scales of, you know, the deepness that you can have in cool. the communication, but there's no need to have any from, kind from of... From beginner to expert, as we say. Exactly. Exactly. Heather or June, did you guys have any questions or comments that you wanted to, to give to... Uh, to uh to mateo heather thanks for being here tonight good to see you back hey good to see you wayne thanks for having me i've really enjoyed this conversation mateo thank you so much um thank you just i, I am, just want to i just want to introduce you to mateo because heather okay. is doing something really amazing she has is amassing a collection of friulani's of, fri- wow. of friulano wines in the united states yes. And she's she's importing them, and she's buying them from different places. And she has a blog called what is it called? Heather Friulano Wine. Yep, friulanowine.com. And she's tasting through like week by week each one of these Friulani because she's been so inspired by Friuli that she's fallen in love with this grape variety. Jesus Christ, would you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm already married, but... Uh, <laughs> I am too. <laughs> okay, so... All right, well, that's out of the question then. But yeah. I, I'm super excited that, that Heather has embarked on this journey, and I've been following her, and uh, we've also been sort of exchanging some messages on Instagram. So um, I'm super psyched that Heather's here tonight. So Heather, go ahead and, and ask Mateo your question. So Sorry, I just wanted to introduce you to that, you. No, that, thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, and that's kind of uh, when you were talking about all the, you know, you can have the same wine, but from different areas within the region, and they can all taste different depending on where in the region they're grown. That's what I'm trying to, I guess, ascertain in my journey of tasting all these different free Ulanos is, um, you know, yeah. all the differences from the different locations they're coming from. So exactly. I'm, I'm really excited to embark on this journey and learn about the region more because I feel like, I will feel more connected to the region through tasting all of these different um, free Ulanos from all over the region. But um, my question for you is, how long is your academy? Like if I were to come there as a visitor, is it something I could do? Is it like a day? Is it like a, every day for a week? Or how, how long? How does it run? How do you run that? Well, yeah, uh, I think it's, it's important to clear up that the academy isn't a course. Yes. It's a place. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a place, and it's open every day. Uh, oh, okay. Every, every day we got a. Um, right now we got a into the website of uh, Colli Orientale de Friuli. 
uh, you can just um, sign up and you know um, we got make an appointment. Uh, yeah, make an appointment. Oh, it's okay. easy, and I, I just answer back with the uh, with the mail, and you just uh, jump in. And uh, we are okay. open uh, every day since uh, you know Monday to Friday from eight o'clock to. Uh, you know, seven o'clock, but it happened to me even to be there on Sunday or Saturday. And my <laughs> wife is very happy about that, of course. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, um, uh, I just want to arrange every kind of, uh, you know, needs that, uh, that, that, you know, that people can have. We used to, the structure is permanent. I mean, we are there. We are there. You can just jump in. And you can just uh, have your point and be there. And uh, it's interesting because uh, about the Friulano that you told before, the Friulano probably is the uh, you know the greatest reader of our land because it's uh, the wine grape that just planted all around, except from the cars, of course, and. Uh, is the one that blind tasted can tell you where it's planted. And it's beautiful. And I'm just arranging with the 32 wines that we put there to do something, you know, with 32 different territories with the same wine for Friulano, for example. We were talking about before with, uh, with no, Wayne Refosco. about Refosco and, uh, and as well. And we're just arranging some focuses, right? And... Uh, uh, the structure is permanent, and I'm there every day, every day from the morning to to the end. So it's that's great to know. So Heather, when, when I I'd like to do something like this first before I take my all my tours of all the wineries in the area because I think that would be very helpful to spend important. time with you first and and learn before I dive into the territory, the different the different wineries. That's important because uh, if you go in a territory, um, you can have a start. In, uh, in the tasting academy because you start from 32 and then you got me that telling you the, all the places and then you go, you know, with having a guide in doing this. Uh, two weeks ago, I had a, a lady that came from Bordeaux. She was the director of the Maison du Vin in Bordeaux. Maison du Vin in Bordeaux, you know that, you know, Bordeaux wineries do not like that, you know, uh, tourists come into there. Yeah, a lot of chateaus don't, are not like open to the public. Exactly. And Maison du Vin are doing the things that consorts are doing. So they can have the okay. tastings and uh, even the things, the technical things that they can do in the vineyard. But you can get there and having your tasting. But just with the bottle that have been opening and uh, just... Uh, not like the Tasting Academy. So she's seen the Tasting Academy, she had the Tasting, she told me, can you come in Bordeaux and do the same thing? Ah, no, no, they're going to steal you from us. We going to understand <laughs> the importance of the Tasting Academy as soon as someone is going to steal from us. This is the story of Yeah, there, that's definitely, and I can't, I'm, I'm surprised that something like that hasn't already happened in a place like Bordeaux or Burgundy where you know it's tough to I had, I had four go call. and taste one. I had four calls yesterday. One from Barolo, one from Emilia Romagna, okay, uh, one from Tuscany, and one from Sicily. They asked me if this is a, a thing that is being you know uh, marked or, or you know or, or, tra or, or uh, if it's been trademarked. Yes, you should say yes. Just say yes. I just said yes. <laughs> yeah, no, you can't. Say yes, and if you want to open your own franchise there, I'm the owner. Exactly. <laughs> no. Exactly. One, one of my goals about the Tasting Academy, because I just started in Ecole Rentale, next year I hope I can do the same room in Udine with 100 of wine, not 30 to 100, for all the DOC of Friuli Venezia Giulia. That would be amazing. And my next goal is to have one of these rooms all around the world, London, Berlin, New York, all around the world, where people can just come in, have their test, and be, you know, educated about the wines, and then they can buy it. This is my goal. This is my big project. Uh, I'm going to die before this is done, <laughs> but, uh, but this You're is my big guy. project. You're a young guy. There's time. There's time. 
I've been young. Do you, yeah. So you mean literally like going into uh, a tasting academy in Hong Kong and yeah. tasting through, I, I don't know if you can taste through a hundred wines, but let's say you do and you fall in love with 10 of them and literally on the spot, put an order in for those wines. But you know what? Um, one of the points and one of the problems that usually people uh, speaking about Friuli Venezia Giulia used to say is that you got too many wines, right? You have not the Barolo, you have not the Brunello, you have not the, you know, the, the big guy that comes right, out. Right, the, the, the one star. I used to believe in my land, in Friuli Venezia Giulia, just like an orchestra. When you have an orchestra, the triangle, the first violin, or every instrument are eager to be into the symphony. And uh, if I have a room where I can tell something just about the land, I don't care about how many wines we have on the, on the disciplinary because I'm going to need more. And I want not just, uh, you know, a hundred. I'm going to need a thousand. And uh, this is the way because I want that. If I, I can see myself in the future, I don't want the people... Uh, speak about Friulano, Sauvignon, Pinot Grigio, Merlot, Tazzeling, whatsoever. I just want people think about the Friuli. Yeah, that's super important. Just like people, the way people think about, you know, Champagne, they don't think about Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Yeah. They think about Bordeaux, they don't think about Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but we got an history, and it's a right to be 300 years, uh, you know, before this. Uh, right. Because we had uh, the World Wars and the stuff, but right now is the moment to, to move. To, to move on that, yeah, to, to develop the... And the this project right now... Is starting to have some, you know, results because I can see people. I can see people what they drink. I can see people what if whether they drink, you know, yeah. uh, a macerated wine, yeah. uh, an acidic wine. I can see people what they like, and nobody. One of the things that I used to to ask to the producers is that simple question: Who is the one who drinks your wine? And, and nobody knows. Nobody knows nobody because knows. they used to, to tell me, I used to sell it to the, uh, that restaurant, that place. But the question, who? And I can see who. Whether it is a, a woman, yeah. a man, what the age, I can see all that stuff. So you are there observing. Yes. People come in and you see a group of people and you can see yes. the way you know, different people react to different wines. So you see like a group of young people, men and women, yeah. and you can see that there's a difference between what the women like and what the guys like. Yes. Or you have a group with older drinkers and younger drinkers and you see it. So you have this unique kind of sort of overview, this kind of position yeah. where you're, and plus you're not just looking at one producer, you're looking at everything. 32. A producer only understands who drinks their Malvasi or who drinks their Pinot Grigio. And even then, it's a stretch because they're not paying much attention because they got to go back and work in the cellar or go, go do something in the vineyard. So they don't have time to sort of remember all of this. But you're there observing. So yes. tell me a little bit about what you've learned. Uh, I, can, I can make you a, a perfect example about this. Yeah. Because... Um, I've seen so many things. I used to manage small groups. This is very important to tell. I never uh, managed groups that are more than eight people, right? So small groups where we work together because it's a room where we work together. It's not about drinking, it's about working together. But it happened to me uh, in having in, uh, the second machine that we have. We got four machines with eight wines each. And the second machine was about all eight Sauvignon, right? And this Sauvignon was like, uh, well, some of them was like, you know, um, uh, oak, something stainless steel. Some of them macerated, all the sort of different Sauvignon, different kind of, uh, um, you know, blends uh, and different kind of territories and different kind even of clones. Okay. And... Uh, I've seen, uh, it was this uh, young girl, uh, she was 25, and uh, 
she really enjoyed one of the Sauvignons, which, which was the 2016, the one, uh, you know, there. And uh, she liked that. And uh, it was a wine with 40, 48 hours of maceration. And uh, she was uh, with uh, his uh, older brother. It was 41, just like I am. And uh, he enjoyed the wine, the, well, the first wine, stainless steel, very pyrazinic wine, very you know, fresh and with a lot of acidity. And I have this question on my mind. Uh, I've been 10 years you know, under a counter of a bar. If I had a couple of them, right, in a dinner, okay. asking me for a Sauvignon, mm. and if I want to you know, acknowledge what uh, the Sauvignon they like for a pairing or something. I know that this guy usually, and I have, you know, many experiences of this kind of thing, likes a, a typical kind of Sauvignon with very, you know, herbatico, pyrazinic, you know, some pepperoni and, you know. Tomato those, leaf, cat exactly, pea, that exactly. whole thing, yeah. And the girl, and the girl. Uh, Doesn't likes, like it doesn't like it, a completely opposite, but the same wine. Okay. What can I do if I am a bartender to make their come together? Or, or a sommelier. These things, if I can tell these things to a bartender, to a restaurant owner. Or, or to a sommelier. To a sommelier, these things can change the evening of that people. Can change the evening uh, and can change uh, you know the um, the perception that you can have of the venue, because yeah. if you if you uh, give them the wrong wine, you give them the wrong plate, you give them the wrong food, and uh, you give them the wrong place, they won't come back. They won't come back. Yeah, They're, if you yeah, that's a big deal. And it's a big deal because if deal. you treat so, them right and you make them happy, they're they'll come back. Differences are everything. Okay. So what what other sort of observations have you had having this kind of exalted position of seeing these different people come and go? What are sort of like the trends? I, I think you spoke about like older people tend to gravitate towards higher acidity wines. Is that, do you think that's a palate problem or do you think that's an education problem? Or why, why is that? And what other sort of trends have you seen? What other sort of general ideas have you seen? One of the things that I've seen is that people um, are asking much more about, uh, you know, the alcohol degree and people are looking for low alcohol degree. People are looking yeah, for big wines uh, and this is a big deal for Friuli because if you got a Friulano, if you got something that can easily get 15 or 14 degrees in Corrizzazzo or whatever. Or Butrio or something Or Butrio, like, for yeah, example. Really easy to reach those levels. You got to think about that. And uh, people used to, um, to be much more closer to the word maceration instead of the meaning of maceration. I mean... Explain that. Right now, uh, you know, it's a kind of fashion in talking about the maceration, right? Right, right. right. But maceration, it's, uh, you know, if you got, for example, you know, that Sauvignon that was telling you before, is 36 hour maceration. It's a, a perfect clean and perfect wine. But usually people think about maceration in having, you know, the seven years in the amphora or whatever it is, which is not. Right. I mean, right now, being um, and having a wine that's got a bit of maceration in extracting what, much more, you know, uh, fruitness into this, instead of going through the acidity, is something that is winning in day having a drink. Okay. And uh, probably right now, if I had to choose... And the next, uh, you know, vintage coming and the harvest coming, I would choose to wait way more before bringing the wine grapes in air, because uh, you know the herb, the herbal, um, you know, vibes are going, you know, 
Ah, so people are less attracted to that yes. green style and they're more looking towards that riper style. Yes, but they this want, is, this but is they what want I less, observe. Yes, but they want less alcohol. Yes. So how how does that jive? So well, I have not obviously the solution. Obviously, ripeness equals equals. Well, Matt, you uh, alcohol. I can I can have a solution. You just ask me for something. But the point is this: give me a solution. I have not the solution. Oh, you don't have a solution. Okay. I, I thought do, you did. I do not have a solution because right. you know uh, the the topic is complex. Yeah, and. The solution is this: you cannot go through the people. You have to go through what is happening to your land. Through the Venezia Giulia, always walk through the people, through the fashions. That's why we have more than eight hundred, you know, actors of Pinot Grigio or Sauvignon like that. We have not to follow. We don't follow. We have to, you know, to decide what we want to be as a grown man or a grown woman. So, so and what, right now, people are asking for native grapes. Okay. So you're saying um, it's important for Friuli to sort of choose a path. Yes. Right? And yes. to make it style. Yes. Right? And then, then you look for your market. Rather than saying, oh, everybody wants Ripola Gialla or everybody wants Pinot Grigio. And now you, everybody, okay, take out all the red wines because everybody wants Pinot Grigio. Um, I mean, wine is not Coca-Cola. It's, yeah. not, it's not a drink. It's something that it's, uh, you know, that changes every year. Right. And uh, we have to, to yeah, change you the narrative uh, yeah. about this. Uh, I mean, and, we can uh, tweak. We can always say, okay, we need a little bit more ripeness or we need a little bit less ripeness or more acidity. We can do with that. But as a general style, we need to kind of, Pick, pick an idea, an identity. Yeah, of course. And I'm, you know, I, I think I'm saying something very banal. I mean, uh, it's very, you know, normal to say every place in the world and in France for sure, they just chosen a path. And uh, right now we have the moment to choose a path. And this is the moment. We, we're not gonna have another moment because uh, in these years, because um, tourism is increasing, um, wine markets are increasing, all the projects are increasing. We need to choose a path, but I cannot do this, uh, and the producer need to do this. Yeah, so the producers have to. I th sometimes I feel like, and you can tell me whether you agree or disagree. Um, that sometimes producers in Friuli lack a little bit of self-confidence, that they need to sort of make their decisions and stick with them and believe in them and say, this is the wine that we make. I mean, you know, I always sort of refer back to Ronchi di Chala. If you look at Ronchi di Chala with some very small exceptions, the wines that they make are the wines that they've always made. And they've gone through ups and downs and they've had moments of crisis and all that sort of stuff. But you know what you're going to get from Ronchi di Chala. Um, and, and there are other wineries that I could refer to too. Miani is one of those, you know, one of those styles as well. Um, you know, Borgo del Tiglio or Via de Romans. I mean, there are tons of wineries here that know who they are and they know the wines that they make. And so many other wineries are like, oh, wait a second, it's... Uh, Ribola Jala. All right. Well, we're going to stop making Rafalsco. We're going to make Ribola Jala, and and I think that's 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 a mistake. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. You're right, but the point is that the, the example that you did is all, all about labels. It's not about you about know the, territory. It's not about a movement uh, or a territory. Okay. And so uh, we need to decide as a territory. Yes, these labels who we are that they did a magnificent work during the years to make you know our land to be known but we know about the labels the point is that as soon as you relate this land to some labels this land is falling apart okay so my goal is uh, uh, these labels which can you know they do a perfect work a perfect job they're amazing we know that. 
But we need to tell the people that, uh, you know, free will and people used to be okay. I mean, if you got your bread on the table and your glass of wine fulfilled, it's okay. You don't need more. Right. Easily satisfied. We need hunger. Uh-huh. We need hunger. We need uh, from the younger uh, wineries, from the younger people to be hungry. Hungry. Hungry, I mean... Uh, and we need guys that need to study, <coughs> sorry, they need to study, they need to look for a house, they need to look for a job, they need to uh, look for a car, they need to look for something. All of the generation of guys that never had the need to look for something had no hunger, just like I had, just like you had, just like normal people has. Without hunger, we ain't going everywhere. So, yeah, and I can see this sort of looking back on the idea of where Friuli came from, Mm. the modern history of Friuli. If you think about what made Friuli great was this period after the Second World War when everything was destroyed and you had to build something. Yeah. Right. You had to build something with either with a passion or with the maybe the little bit of land that your folks had, or maybe a business that you were sort of kind of scraping by, and you were saying, "I need more." Right. I need to make, and I want to do something big. Um, and then, so what we're at now is kind of a point where maybe that second generation after the war that kind of got handed this stuff. Yes. Now we're in the. Th- the, the 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 second the the, the third generation after the war, yeah. so maybe those guys are kind of back to that idea because things aren't as easy here as they used to be. A lot of competition, competition from Alto Adige, competition from New Zealand, competition from all over the world, and now they're kind of like, oh, okay, we we really got to do something here. Well, we can see this in a different way. Third generation was about building something to be, you know, on your foot because everything was destroyed. Second right. generation was about building you know, a label, a brand. Third generation should be, and we are here right now, should be to construct a, a territory. A territory. Because the brand you have, the hunger you have not anymore, right now you have to, you know, to put something about the territory. Right. The fourth generation would be the one that have that territory go beyond their own labels. Because at, the examples are very simple. We have right now bottles in the U.S. all around, which is written Pinot Grigio right now. Okay, Pinot Grigio or Sauvignon, for example. And uh, do you read, or how many people does read down after Pinot Grigio, where it comes from? Almost nobody. Exactly. This is the point. This is the point. And Pinot Grigio is uh, close to the 35% of our land. We have to work ab- about our land, our native grapes. Uh, the day that we're going to see on, you know, on the label, on the bottle, just the written Collio, Collio Rentale, or Grave, I don't care, or Aquileia, Without caring what kind of wine is in there. What kind of grapes? That's the point. That's where, we're, that's where we got to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I think that's, that's and I like when you're talking about that sort of progression where you're saying, okay, first we started off, you had to make a living. Now you have to make a brand. You know? And then the next step is we need to make a, a place, a territory. Yes. So we're kind of, it reminds me of going back to, to, to Ben Little, we talked a little bit about Maslow's pyramid, right? Yeah. So you start off with like your bare minimums. You had to live. You had to make a, a, a living. And then sort of you're, you know, you, you're moving up. And now we're sort of moving towards the tip of that pyramid where we're becoming a territory, a worldwide power as far as a territory is concerned, like Barolo or like Bordeaux. And I think that's, that's definitely the way you got to go. Yeah. This cool. is what, uh, what I'm thinking about. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Um, I'm going to ask if anybody, Keith and Cole and Rosella are in the audience. I've all invited them up. I want to invite them to come up and speak if they have any questions or if Luciana or Heather 
have any more questions for Mateo, now's the time to do it. Um, Cole or Rosella, do you get Heather? Yes, go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you again. It's been a, it's been a pleasure to to learn and listen. So I'm just very happy that Mateo is here today. No, Mateo is great. Thank you. Thank Heather. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Keith, Cole, Rosella, did you have anything that you wanted to jump in and say? Um, yep, yeah, Rosella has left, so she's obviously very satisfied with the evening. <laughs> no, she's back. Hang on. She's raised her hand. Hang on. I'm going to bring her up on stage. Here she comes. I think I invited her up on stage. Rosella, yes. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank I you. I think you're quite well with all these uh, beautiful people around you. Oh, um, I'm always very, very happy. <laughs> Did you have something you wanted to ask, Matteo? Oh, well, basically, uh, I think I've missed the way that I can find uh, this Wine Tasting Academy because uh, I, th I think there should be a website somewhere where I can, uh, can have a look and maybe book something because it, I think it's quite interesting. And also the things that he, you were talking about are really... Yeah, Matteo, well, is there a website you can, you can go to? Can you explain that so people can figure out where they're, where they're going. Yeah, well, it's quite easy. Uh, the website it's um, Collierentali, uh, written on you know Collierentali dot com, okay. and uh, on the you know on the main page you just have uh, the Tasting Academy, which is written Prenota qui. You just okay. clicking upon, or you can just uh, uh, write me on my you know uh, social pages. Uh, uh, story you know what's that because the same person that uh, you just uh, book it, it's always me okay uh, it's, always, <laughs> it's, it's quite easy what's what's your instagram handle uh at story divino fvg story okay. divino okay, okay yeah, got it. yeah you can book you. but it's easy on a website you yeah. just uh, click and uh, ask uh, uh, because you can have you know the timetable where you can um, come uh, so it's, your it's easy so colli orientali dot com dot com okay okay so got it. yeah fantastic thank you, thank you rosella thank you. yeah hope thank to see you. you in friuli keith did you have a question yep. you came up on stage yeah uh just wanted to uh thank you wayne for uh, these very very interesting uh topics that you've been uh throwing at us well keith, and, that means uh, a lot coming from you because you know a lot about wine yeah so and, that uh, makes me super happy it's very interesting, and I'm really, uh, you know, super psyched about the um, the project that Matteo has uh, mentioned, and look forward to being able to visit it, um, you know, sometime in the future when we all get our hands back uh, back together. Yeah, I I would love to see you here, Keith. I, I I think maybe you were here years ago with the Wine Lover Group. I would love to have you back. So yeah, that would be great. So cool. Thank you, Keith, very much for, for chiming in. Thank you, Rosella. Hopefully you guys are, are all uh, taken care of and all of the questions have been answered. Um, Matteo, thank you so much Ma for being you. here tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and being so interesting and being so enthusiastic about Free William Wines. That's why I love having you on. It's not your first time on Clubhouse, but it is the first time uh, being here with us in the, in the studio taverna. So thank you so much for, for bringing your passion here. Um, and, Thanks for and spending having me. Some time. Thank you. Thank cool. you. Thanks as always to Robbie Milani, our super sound guy. Number one. Couldn't do it without you, my brother. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you all for being here. Luciana, Heather, Rosella, Keith, Cole, a couple of people who've left. June has left as well. So um, yeah, thanks everybody for being here tonight. I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you, Mateo. Cheers. And Thank we you. will see you all very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I want to thank everybody this evening for coming. Thank you for listening. I appreciate uh, Natalie Benlolo, our co-host, Rob Milani, our sound guy. Follow me on La Taverna Friuli on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram at Wayne McGrape. And you can find this awesome music on YouTube at Beat Ambassador. Finishes with an A. Thank you.